How We Went to Mars. First published in Amateur Science Fiction Stories, March 1938. Not previously collected in book form. NB. All characters in this story are entirely fictitious and only exist in the author's subconscious. The psychanalysts, please apply at the tradesman's entrance. It is with considerable trepidation that I now take up my pen to describe the incredible adventures that befell the members of the Snoring in the Hay Rocket Society in the winter of 1952. Although we would have preferred posterity to be our judge, the members of the society, of which I am proud to be president, secretary and treasurer, feel that we cannot leave unanswered the accusations, nay calumnies, made by envious rivals as to our integrity, sobriety and even sanity. In this connection, I would like to take the opportunity of dealing with the fantastic statements regarding our achievements made in the Daily Drool by Professor Swivel and in the Weekly Washout by Dr. Sprocket. But unfortunately, space does not permit. In any case, I sincerely hope that no intelligent reader was deceived by these persons' vaporings. No doubt most of you will recollect the tremendous awakening of public interest in the science of rocketry caused by the celebrated case in 1941 of Rex versus British Rocket Society and its still more celebrated sequel, British Rocket Society versus Rex. The first case, which was started when a five-ton rocket descended in the Houses of Parliament upon Admiral Sir Horatio Froth Frenzy, MP, KCB, HP, DT, after a most successful stratosphere flight, may be said to have resulted in a draw, thanks to the efforts of Sir Hatrick Pastings, KC, whom the BRS had managed to brief as a result of their success in selling lunar real estate at exorbitant prices. The appeal brought by the BRS against the restrictions of the 1940 Rocket Propulsion Act was an undoubted victory for the society, as the explosion in court of a demonstration model removed all opposition and most of Temple Bar. Incidentally, it has recently been discovered after extensive excavations that there were no members of the BRS in the court at the time of the disaster. A rather an odd coincidence. Moreover, both the survivors state that a few minutes before the explosion, Mr. Hector Heptane, the president of the society, passed very close to the rocket and then left the court hurriedly. Although an inquiry was started, it was then too late, as Mr. Heptane had already left for Russia, in order, as he put it, to continue work unhampered by the toils of capitalist enterprise, in a country where workers and scientists are properly rewarded by the gratitude of their comrades. But I digress. It was not until the repeal of the 1940 Act that progress could continue in England, when a fresh impetus was given to the movement by the discovery in Surrey of a large rocket labelled Property of a USSR, Please Return to Omsk, obviously one of Mr. Heptane's. A flight from Omsk to England, though quite understandable, was certainly a remarkable achievement, and not until many years later was it discovered that the rocket had been dropped from an aeroplane by the members of the Hickleborough Rocket Association, who even in those days were expert publicity hunters. By 1945, there were a score of societies in the country, each spreading destruction over rapidly widening areas. My society, though only founded in 1949, already has to its credit one church, two Methodist chapels, five cinemas, 17 trust houses, and innumerable private residences, some as far away as Weevil in the Wurzel and Little Dithering. However, there can be no doubt in unprejudiced minds that the sudden collapse of the lunar crater Vitus was caused by one of our rockets. In spite of the claims of the French, German, American, Russian, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, Swiss, and Danish societies, to mention only a few, all of whom we are asked to believe dispatched rockets moonwards a few days before the phenomenon was witnessed. At first, we contented ourselves with firing large models to considerable heights. These test rockets were fitted with recording barrow thermographs, etc., and our lawyers kept us fully informed as to their landing places. We were progressing very favourably with this important work, 
when the unwarrantable defection of our insurance company forced us to start work on a large man-carrying spaceship. We already had a sufficiently powerful fuel, details of which I cannot divulge here, save to say that it was a complex hydrocarbon into which our chemist, Dr. Badstoff, had with great ingenuity introduced no less than 16 quadruple carbon bonds. This new fuel was so violent that at first it caused a rapid change in our personnel, but by continued research it had been stabilized until the explosion took place when expected on 97 and a half occasions out of 100, in which it showed its immense superiority over Dr. Sprocket's triple heavy hyperhyzone, 20 occasions in 100, and Professor Swivel's nitrogen heptafluoride, probability of non-explosion incommensurable. The ship itself was 30 meters long and was made of molded neo-bakelite with crystallux windows and consisted of two steps which were ample thanks to our new fuel. The whole thing would have cost a great deal of money had we intended to pay for it. The rocket motors were made of one of the new Burroughs silicon alloys and had an operating time of several minutes. Apart from these features, our ship did not differ materially from any other designed previously, except in so far that it had actually been constructed. We had no intention of venturing far out into space on our first flight, but circumstances, of which I shall relate, altered our plans in an unforeseen manner. On the 1st of April, 1952, everything was ready for a preliminary flight. I broke the customary vacuum flask on the prow of the ship, christened it the pride of the galaxy, and we, this is myself and the five surviving members of the Council of Twenty-Five, entered the cavern and carefully sealed the door, squeezing the chewing gum into all the cracks. The ship itself was resting on a balloon-type undercarriage, and we had a straight run of two miles over various people's lawns and gardens. Now, we intended to rise to a height of a few hundred miles and then to glide back to Earth, landing as best we could with little regard for life or property save our own. I seated myself at the controls and the others lay in the compensating hammocks which we hoped might save us from the shock of the takeoff. In any case every spaceship has them and we could hardly do otherwise. With an expression of grim determination which I had to assume several times before Ivan Schnitzel, our official photographer, was satisfied, I pressed the starting button and rather to our surprise the ship began to move. After leaving our grounds it tore through a fence into a vegetable garden, which it rapidly converted into a ploughed field, and then passed over a large lawn, doing comparatively little damage, apart from setting fire to a few greenhouses. By now we were nearing a row of buildings, which might offer some resistance, and as we had not yet lifted, I turned the power full on. With a tremendous roar, the ship leapt into the air, and amid the groans of my companions, I lost consciousness. When I recovered, I realised that we were in space and jumped to my post to see if we were falling back to Earth. But I had forgotten my weightless condition and crashed headfirst against the ceiling, once more losing consciousness. When I recovered, I very carefully made my way to the window and with relief saw that we were now floating back to Earth. My relief was short-lived when I found that the Earth was nowhere in sight. I at once realized that we must have been unconscious for a very long time. My less robust companion still lay in a coma, or rather several comas, at the end of the cabin, the hammocks having given way under the strain to the detriment of their occupants. I first inspected the machinery, which so far as I could tell seemed intact, and then set about reviving my companions. This I readily did by pouring a little liquid air down their necks. When all were conscious, or as nearly so as could be expected in the circumstances, I rapidly outlined the situation and explained the need for complete calm. After the resulting hysteria had subsided, I asked for volunteers to go outside in a spacesuit and inspect the ship. I'm sorry to say that I had to go myself. Luckily, the exterior of the ship seemed quite intact, though there were bits of branches and a trespassers will be prosecuted notice stuck in the rudder. These I detached and threw away, but unluckily they got into an orbit round the ship and returned round the back catching me a resounding whack on the head. The impact knocked me off the ship, and to my horror, 
I found myself floating in space. I did not, of course, lose my head, but immediately looked around for some method by which I could return. In the pouch on the exterior of the spacesuit, I found a safety pin, two tram tickets, a double-headed penny, a football pool coupon covered with what seemed to be orbital calculations, and a complimentary ticket to the Russian ballet. After a careful scrutiny of these, I came to the reluctant conclusion that they offered little hope. Even if I could bring myself to throw away the penny, its momentum would, I rapidly calculated, be insufficient to return me to the ship. The tickets I did throw away, rather as a gesture than anything else, and I was about to throw the safety pin after them. It would have given me a velocity of 0 0.000001 millimetres an hour, which was better than nothing, by in fact 0 0.000001 millimetres an hour, when a splendid idea occurred to me. I carefully punctured my spacesuit with the pin, and in a moment the escaping jet of air drove me back to the ship. I entered the airlock just as the suit collapsed, not a moment too soon. My companions crowded round me, eager for news, though there was little that I could tell them. It would take prolonged measurements to discover our position, and I commenced this important work at once. After ten minutes' observation of the stars, followed by five hours' intensive calculations on our specially lubricated multiple slide rules, I was able to announce to the relief of all present that we were 5,670,000 miles from the Earth, 365,000 miles above the ecliptic, travelling towards right ascension, 23 hours, 15 minutes, 37.07 seconds, declination 153 degrees, 17 feet, 36 inches. We had feared that we might have been moving towards, for example, RA 12 hours, 19 minutes, 7.3 seconds, deck 169 degrees, 15 feet, 17 inches, or even if the worst had happened, RA 5 hours, 32 minutes, 59.9 seconds, deck 0 degrees, 0 feet, 0 inches. At least, we were doing this when we took our observations, but as we had moved several million miles in the meantime, we had to start all over again to find where we were now. After several trials, we succeeded in finding where we were only two hours before we found it. But in spite of the greatest efforts, we could not reduce the time taken in calculation to less than this value. So with this, we had to be content. The Earth was between us and the Sun, which was why we could not see it. Since we were travelling in the direction of Mars, I suggested that we could continue on our present course and try to make a landing on the planet. I had grave doubts, in fact, as to whether there was anything else we could do. So, for two days, we cruised on towards the Red Planet, my companions relieving the tedium with dominoes, poker, and three-dimensional billiards, which, of course, can only be played in the absence of gravity. However, I had little time for these pursuits, as I had to keep constant check on the ship's position. In any case, I was completely fleeced on the first day, and was unable to obtain any credit from my grasping companions. All the time, Mars was slowly growing larger, and as we drew nearer and nearer, many were the speculations we made as to what we should find when we landed on the mysterious red planet. One thing we can be certain of, remarked Isaac Gusbaum, our auditor, to me as we were looking through the ports at the world, now only a few million miles away, we won't be met by a lot of old Johnnies with flowing robes and boards who will address us in perfect English and give us the freedom of the city, as in so many science fiction stories. I'll bet our next year's deficit on that. Finally, we began our braking manoeuvres and curved down towards the planet in a type of logarithmic spiral whose first, second and third differential coefficients are in harmonic ratio, a curve on which I hold all patents. We made a landing near the equator, as close to the Solus Lacus as possible. Our ship slid for several miles across the desert, leaving a trail of fused quartz behind it, where the blast touched the ground, and ended up with its nose in a sand dune. Our first move was to investigate the air. We decided unanimously, only Mr. Gusbaum dissenting, that Mr. Gusbaum should be detailed to enter the airlock and sample the Martian atmosphere. Fortunately for him, it proved fit for human consumption, and we all joined Isaac in the airlock. 
I then stepped solemnly out onto Martian soil, the first human being in history to do so, while Ivan Schnitzel recorded the scene for the benefit of history. As a matter of fact, we later found that he had forgotten to load the camera. Perhaps this was just as well, for my desire for strict accuracy compels me to admit that no sooner did I touch the ground than it gave way beneath my feet, precipitating me into a sandy pit from which I was with difficulty rescued by my companions. However, in spite of this mishap, we eventually clambered up the dune and surveyed the countryside. It was most uninteresting, consisting solely of long ridges of heaped-up sand. We were debating what to do when suddenly we heard a high-pitched whining noise in the sky, and to our surprise, a cigar-shaped metal vessel dropped to the ground a few yards away. A door slid open. Fire when you see the whites of their eyes, hissed Eric Wobblewit, our tame humorist. But I could tell that his joke was even more forced than usual. Indeed, we all felt nervous as we waited for the occupants of the ship to emerge. They were three old men with long beards, clad in flowing white robes. Behind me, I heard a dull thud as Isaac passed out. The leader spoke to me in what would have been flawless BBC English, had it not been for his bits he'd obviously picked up from Schenectady. Welcome, visitors from Earth. I am afraid this is not an authorised landing place, but we will let that pass for the moment. We have come to guide you to our city of Izgitbrook. Thanks, I replied, somewhat taken aback. I am sure we're very grateful to you for your trouble. Is it far to Zixgitbrook? The Martian winced. Izgitbrook? He said firmly. Well, is Gipical, then I went on desperately. The other two Martians looked pained and took a firmer grip on their rod-like instruments they were carrying. These, we learned later, were walking sticks. The leader gave me up as a bad job. Skip it, he said. It's about 50 miles away as the crow flies, though as there aren't any crows on Mars, we have never been able to check this very accurately. Could you fly your ship behind us? Well, we would, I replied. Though we'd rather not, unless uh, is get uh, your city is heavily insured with a reputable firm. Could you carry us? No doubt you have tractor beams and such like. The Martian seemed surprised. Yes, we have, he said. But how did you know it? <laughs> Just a surmise, I replied modestly. Well, we'll get over to our ship and leave the rest to you. We did so, carrying the prostrate Guzbaum with us and in a few minutes was speeding over the desert after the Martian ship. Soon the spires of the mighty city reared above the horizon, and in a short time we landed in a great square surrounded by teeming crowds. In a trice, or less, we were facing a battery of cameras and microphones, or their Martian equivalents. Our guide spoke a few words and then beckoned to me. With characteristic foresight, I had prepared a speech before leaving Earth, so I pulled it from my pocket and read it to, no doubt, the entire Martian nation. It was only when I'd finished that I noticed I was reading the lecture, British science fiction authors, their prevention or cure, which I'd given to the SFA a few months before, and which had already involved me in six libel actions. This was unfortunate, but from the reception, I'm sure that the Martians found it of interest. The Martian cheer, oddly enough, closely resembles the terrestrial boo. We were then taken, with difficulty, onto a moving road which led to a giant building in the centre of the city, where a lavish meal awaited us. What it consisted of we never succeeded in ascertaining, and we rather hoped it was synthetic. After the meal, we were asked what part of the city we would like to visit, as it was entirely at our disposal. We did our best to explain what a variety show was, but the idea seemed beyond our guides, and as we had feared, they insisted on showing us over their power plants and factories. Here, I must say, we found our knowledge of contemporary science fiction invaluable, for everything with which the Martians tried to surprise us we had heard of long before. Their atomic generators, for instance, we compared unfavourably with those described by many terrestrial writers, though we took care to secure the plans, and we expressed surprise at their inability to overcome those laws of nature that have been repealed by our economists and politicians for years. In fact, and I say it with pride, the Martians got very little change out of us. 
When the tour finished, I was lecturing the leader on the habits of termites, and behind me I could hear Mr. Gusbaum, now alas his normal self, criticising the scandalously low rates of interest allowed in Martian trade. After this we were not bothered any more, and we were able to spend most of our time indoors playing poker and some curious Martian games we had picked up, including an interesting mathematical one which I can best describe as four-dimensional chess. Unfortunately, it was so complicated that none of my companions could understand it, and accordingly I had to play against myself. I'm sorry to say that I invariably lost. Of our adventures on Mars, I could say a great deal, and I'm going to at a later date. My forthcoming book, Mars with the Lid Off, should be out in the spring and will be published by Blotto and Windup at 21 shillings. All I will say at the moment is that we were very well entertained by our hosts, and I believe that we gave them a favourable impression of the human race. We made it quite clear, however, that we were somewhat exceptional specimens, and we did not want our hosts to be unduly disappointed by the expeditions after ours. So well indeed were we treated that one of us decided not to return to Earth when the time came, for reasons which I shall not go into here, as he has a wife and family on Earth. I may have something more to say about this matter in my book. We had, unfortunately, only a week in which to stay on Mars as the planets were rapidly moving apart. Our Martian friends had very kindly refuelled our ship for us, and also gave us many mementos of our visit, some of them of considerable value. Whether these souvenirs belong to the society as a whole, or to the individual officers, is a matter that has not yet been settled. I would, however, point out to those members who have been complaining that possession is nine points of the law, and where the possessors are my esteemed colleagues, it is more like ten. Our return to Earth was uneventful, and thanks to our great reserve of fuel, we were able to make a landing where and how we liked. Consequently, we chose a spot which would focus the eyes of the world upon us and bring home to everybody the magnitude of our accomplishment. Of our landing in Hyde Park and the consequent evaporation of the Serpentine, enough has been written elsewhere, and the spectacle of three-inch headlines in the next day's Times was proof enough that we had made our mark in history. Everyone will remember my broadcast from the cells in Vine Street Police Station, where we were taken at the triumphant conclusion of our flight. And there is no need for me to add any more at the moment, since, moreover, it might embarrass my lawyers. We are content to know that we have added something, however small, to the total of human knowledge, and something, however large, to the bank balance of our society. What more than this could we desire? Retreat from Earth First published in Amateur Science Fiction Stories, March 1938. Collected in The Best of Arthur C. Clarke, 1937 to 1955. I suspect that my interest in these amazing creatures was triggered by Paul Ernst's The Raid on the Termites in Astounding Stories, June 1932. A great many millions of years ago, when man was a dream of the distant future, the third ship to reach Earth in all history descended through the perpetual clouds onto what is now Africa, and the creatures it had carried across an unthinkable abyss of space looked out upon a world which would be a fit home for their weary race. But Earth was already inhabited by a great, though dying, people, and since both races were civilized in the true sense of the word, they did not go to war, but made a mutual agreement for those who then ruled Earth had once ruled everywhere within the orbit of Pluto, had planned always for the future, and even at their end, they had prepared Earth for the race that was to come after them. And so, 40 million years after the last of the old ones had gone to his eternal rest, men began to rear their cities where once the architects of a greater race had flung their towers against the clouds. And in the long, Echoing centuries before the birth of man, the aliens had not been idle, but had covered half the planet with their cities, filled with blind, fantastic slaves. And though man knew these cities, for they often caused him infinite trouble, yet he never suspected that all around him in the tropics 
an older civilization than his, was planning busily for the day when it would once again venture forth upon the seas of space to regain its lost inheritance. Gentlemen, said the President of the Council gravely, I am sorry to say that we have received a severe setback in our plans to colonize the third planet. As you all know, we have for many years been working on that planet, unknown to its inhabitants, preparing for the day when we should take over complete control. We anticipated no resistance, for the people of three are at a very primitive level of development and, and possess no weapons which could harm us. Moreover, they are continually quarreling among themselves owing to the extraordinary number of political groups or uh, nations into which they are divided, a lack of unity which will no doubt be a considerable help to our plans. To obtain the fullest possible knowledge of the planet and its peoples, we have had several hundred investigators working on three, a number in each important city. Our men have done very well, and thanks to their regular reports, we now have a detailed knowledge of this strange world. In fact, until a few sitas ago, I would have said that we knew everything of importance concerning it. But now I find that, the, uh, <laughs> that we were very much mistaken. Our chief investigator in the country known as England, which has been mentioned here on a number of occasions, <laughs> was that very intelligent young student, Kervak Teton, grandson of the great Vorak. He progressed splendidly with the English, a particularly guileless race, it seems, and, and, and it was soon accepted into their highest society. He even spent some time at one of their great seats of learning, so-called, but soon left in disgust. Though it had nothing to do with his real purpose, this energetic young man also studied the wild animals of three. For remarkable though it seems, there are a great many strange and interesting creatures roaming freely over large areas of the planet. Some are actually dangerous to a man, but he has he has conquered most of them and even exterminated some species. It was while studying these beasts that Gervak made the discovery, which I fear may change our whole plan of action. But uh, let Gervak speak for him. Self. The president threw a switch, and from concealed speakers, Pervac Thetan's voice rang out over that assembly of the greatest brains of Mars. Come to what is the most important part of this communication. Uh, for some time I have been studying the many wild creatures of this planet purely for the sake of scientific knowledge. The animals of three are divided into four main groups, mammals, fishes, reptiles, and insects, and a number of lesser groups. There have been many representatives of the first three classes on our own planet. Of course, there are none now. But as far as I know, there have never been uh, insects on our world at any time in its history. Uh, consequently, they attracted my attention from the first, and I made a careful study of their habits and structure. Uh, you who have never seen them, will have great difficulty in imagining what these creatures are like. There are millions of different types, and it would take ages to classify all of them. But they are mostly small animals with many jointed limbs and with a hard armored body. They are mostly very small, about a half a zem in length, and are often winged. Most of them lay eggs and undergo a number of metamorphoses before they become perfect creatures. I am sending with this report a number of photographs and films which will give you a better idea of their infinite variety than any words of mine. I obtain most of my information on the subject from the literature which has been built up by thousands of patient students who have devoted their lives to watching insects at work. The inhabitants of three have taken much interest in the creatures which share their world, and this, I think, is another proof that they are more intelligent than some of our scientists would have us believe. At this, there were smiles in the audience, for the House of Thetan had always been noted for its radical and unorthodox views. In my studies, I came across accounts of some extraordinary creatures which live in the tropical regions of the planet. They are called 
termites or white ants and live in large, wonderfully organized communities. They even have cities, huge mounds, honeycombed with passages and made of exceedingly hard materials. They, they can perform prodigious feats of engineering, being able to bore through metals and glass, and they can destroy most of man's creations when they wish. They eat cellulose, that is, wood, and since man uses this material extensively, he is always waging war on these destroyers of his possessions. Perhaps luckily for him, the termites have even deadlier enemies, the ants, which are a very similar type of creature. And these two races have been at war for geological ages, and the outcome is still undecided. Uh, although they are blind, uh, the termites cannot endure light, and so even when they venture from their cities, they always keep under cover, making tunnels and uh, cement tubes if they have to cross open country. They are wonderful engineers and architects, and uh, no ordinary obstacle will deflect them from their purpose. Their most remarkable achievement, however, is... It's a biological one. From the same eggs, they can produce uh, half a dozen different types of specialized creature. Thus, they can breed fighters with immense claws, soldiers which can spray poison over their opponents, workers which act as food stores by virtue of their immense distended stomachs, and a number of other fantastic mutations. You, uh, you will find a, a full account of them, as far as they are known to the naturalists of three, uh, in the books uh, that, that I am sending. The more I read of their achievements, the more I was impressed by the perfection of their social system. It occurred to me, as indeed it had to many previous students, that a termitary may be compared to a vast machine whose component parts are not of metal, but of protoplasm, whose wheels and cogs are separate insects, each with some preordained role to perform. It was not until later that I found how near the truth this analogy was. Nowhere in the termitary is there any waste or disorder, and everywhere there is mystery. As I considered the matter, it seemed to me that the termites were much more worthy of our attention from the purely scientific point of view than man himself. <laughs> After all, man is not so very different from ourselves, though I shall annoy many by saying so, yet these insects are utterly alien to us in every way. They work, live, and die for the, for the good of the state. To them, the individual is nothing. With us, and, and with man, the state exists only for the individual. Uh, who shall say which is right? Uh, these problems so engross me that I eventually decided to study the little creatures myself with all the instruments at my command, instruments of which the naturalists of three had never dreamt. So I selected a small uninhabited island in a lonely part of the Pacific, the greatest ocean of three, where the strange mounds of the termites clustered thickly and constructed on it a, a little metal building to serve as a laboratory. As I was thoroughly impressed by the creature's destructive powers, I cut a wide circular moat round the building, leaving enough room for my ship to land, but letting the sea flow in. I thought oh, ten zets of water would keep them from doing any mischief. <laughs> How foolish that moat looks now. These preparations took several weeks, for it was not very often that I was able to leave England. In my little space yacht, the journey from London to Termite Island took under half a sectore, so very little time was lost in this way. The laboratory was equipped with everything I considered might be useful, and many things for which I could see no conceivable use, but which might possibly be required. The most important instrument was a high-powered gamma-ray televisor, which I hoped would reveal to me all the secrets hidden from ordinary sight by the walls of the termitary. Perhaps equally useful was a very sensitive psychometer of the kind we use when exploring planets on which new types of mentalities may exist and which we might not detect in the ordinary way. The device could operate on any conceivable mind frequency and at its highest amplification could locate a man several hundred miles away. I was certain that even if the termites possessed only the faintest glimmers of an utterly alien intelligence, I would be able to detect their, their mental processes. At first I made relatively little progress. With the televisor I examined all the nearest termitaries, and fascinating work it was, following the workers along the passages of their homes as they carried food and building materials hither and thither. <laughs> I watched the enormous bloated queen in the royal nursery laying her endless stream of eggs, one every few seconds, night and day, year after year. 
Although she was the center of the colony's activities, yet when I focused the psychometer on her, the needles did not so much as flicker. The very cells of my body could do better than that. The monstrous queen was only a, 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 a brainless mechanism, nonetheless mechanical because she was made of protoplasm, and the workers looked after her with the care we would devote to one of our useful robots. For a number of reasons, I had not expected the queen to be the ruling force of the colony, but when I began to explore with psychometer and televisor, nowhere could I discover any creature, any super termite, which directed and supervised the operations of the rest. This would not have surprised the scientists of three, for they hold that the termites are governed by instinct alone. But my instrument could have detected the nervous stimuli, which constitute automatic reflex actions, and yet I found nothing. I would turn up the amplification to its utmost, put on a pair of those primitive but very useful headphones, and, and listen hour on hour. Sometimes there would be those faint characteristic cracklings we have never been able to explain, but generally the only sound was the subdued washing noise, like waves breaking on some far-off beach caused by the massed intellects of the planet reacting on my apparatus. I was beginning to get discouraged. When there occurred one of those accidents which happens so often in science. I was dismantling the instrument after another fruitless investigation when I happened to knock the little receiving loop so that it pointed to the, to the ground. And to my surprise, the needle started flickering violently. By swinging the loop in the usual way, I, I discovered that the exciting source lay almost directly underneath me, though at what distance I could not guess. In the phones was a continuous humming uh, a noise interspersed with sudden flickerings. It sounded for all the world like any electric machine operating, and, and the frequency, 100,000 mega mega cycles, was not one on which minds have ever been known to function before. To my intense annoyance, as you can guess, I had to return to England at once, and so I could not do anything more at the time. It was a fortnight before I could return to Termite Island, and in that time I had to overhaul my little space yacht owing uh, to an electrical fault. At some time in her history, which I know to have been an eventful one, she uh, had been fitted with ray screens. There were, uh, moreover, very good ray screens, <laughs> much too good for a law-abiding ship to possess. I have every reason to believe, in fact, uh, that more than once they have defied the cruisers of the Assembly. I did not much relish of the task of checking over the complex automatic relay circuits, but at last it was done, and I set off at top speed for the Pacific, traveling so fast that my bow wave must have been one continuous explosion. Okay. Unfortunately, I soon had to slow down again, for I found that the directional beam I had installed on the island was no longer functioning. I presumed that a fuse had blown, and had to take observations and navigate in the ordinary way. The accident was annoying, but not alarming, and I finally spiraled down over Termite Island with no premonition of danger. I landed inside my little moat and went uh, to the door of the laboratory. As I spoke the key word, the metal seal slid open and a tremendous blast of vapor gushed out of the room. I was nearly stupefied by the stuff in it, and it was some time before I recovered sufficiently to realize what had happened. When I, when I regained my senses, I recognized the smell of hydrogen cyanide a gas which is instantly fatal to human beings, but which only affects us after a considerable time. At first, I thought that there had been some accident in the laboratory, but I soon remembered that there were not enough chemicals to produce anything like the volume of gas that had gushed out, and in any case, what could possibly have produced such an accident? When I turned to the laboratory itself, I had my second, my second shock. One, one glance was sufficient to show that the place was in ruins, not a piece of apparatus was recognizable. The cause of the damage was soon apparent. <laughs> the power plant, my little atomic motor, had exploded. But why? Atomic motors do not explode without very good reason. It would be bad business if they did. I made a careful examination of the room and presently found a number of little holes coming up through the floor, holes such as the termites make when they travel from place to place. My suspicions. Incredible though they were, began to be confirmed. It was not completely impossible that the creatures might flood my room with poisonous gas, but to imagine that they understood atomic motors, that was too much. To settle the matter, I started hunting for the fragments of the generator, and to my consternation, found that the synchronizing coils had been short-circuited. Still, 
clinging to the shattered remnants of the osmium toroid with the jaws of the termite that had been sacrificed to wreck the motor. Uh, uh, for a long time, I sat in the ship considering these outstanding facts. Obviously, the damage had been wrought by the intelligence I had located for a moment on my last visit. If it were the termite ruler, and there was nothing else it could very well be, how, how did it come to possess its knowledge of atomic motors and the only way in which to wreck them? For some reason, possibly because I was prying too deeply into its secrets, it had decided to destroy me and my works. Its first attempt had been unsuccessful, but it might try again with better results, though I did not imagine that it could harm me inside the stout walls of my yacht. Although my psychometer and televisor had been destroyed, I was determined not to be defeated so easily and started hunting with the ship's televisor, which, though not made for this kind of work, could do it very well. Now, since I lacked the essential psychometer, it was some time before I found what I was looking for. I had to explore great sections of the ground with my instrument, focusing the viewpoint through stratum after stratum and, and examining any suspicious rock that came into the field. When I was at a depth of nearly 200 feet, I noticed uh, a dark mass looming faintly in the distance, rather like a very large boulder embedded in the soil. But when I approached, I saw with a great feeling of elation that it was no boulder, but a perfect sphere of metal, about 20 feet in diameter. Well, my search, my search had ended. There was a slight fading of the image as I drove the beam through the metal, and then on the screen lay revealed the lair of the super termite. I had expected to find some fantastic creature, perhaps uh, uh, a great naked brain with vestigial limbs, but at a glance I could see that there was no living thing in that sphere. From wall to wall, that metal enclosed space was packed with a maze of machinery, most of it very minute and almost unthinkably complex, and all of it clicking, clicking, buzzing with, with, with lightning-like rapidity. Compared to this miracle of electrical engineering, our great television exchanges would seem the creations of children or savages. I, I, I could see myriads of tiny relays operating, director valves flashing intermittently, and strangely shaped cams spinning among moving mazes of apparatus utterly unlike anything, anything we have ever built. To the makers of this machinery, my atomic generator, it must have, it must have seemed a toy. Oh, for, for perhaps two seconds I gazed in wonder at that amazing sight, and, and then, then suddenly an incredibly... An obliterating veil of interference slashed down, and the screen was a dancing riot of formless color. Here was something we have never been able to produce, a screen which the televisor could not penetrate. The power of this strange creature was even greater than I had imagined. And in the face of this latest revelation, I, I, I no longer felt safe, even in my ship. In fact, I had a sudden desire to put as many miles as possible between myself and Termite Island. This impulse was so strong that a minute later I was high over the Pacific, rising up through the stratosphere in the great ellipse which would curve down again in England. Yes, yes, you may smile or accuse me of cowardice, saying that my grandfather Vorak would not have done so, but, but, but listen, I was about a hundred miles from the island, thirty miles high, and already traveling at two thousand miles an hour, when there came a sudden crashing of relays, and the low purr of the motors changed to a tremendous deep-throated roar. As an overload was thrown onto them, a glance at the board showed me what had happened. The, the ray screens were on, flaring beneath the impact of a heavy induction beam, but there was comparatively little power behind the beam, though had I been nearer, it would have been a very different tale, and my screens dis dissipated it without much trouble, you see. Nevertheless, the occurrence gave me an unpleasant shock for the moment until I remembered that old trick of electrical warfare and threw the full field of my geodesic generators into the beam. I switched on the televisor just in time to see the incandescent fragments of Termite Island fall back into the Pacific. And so I returned to England with one problem solved and a dozen greater ones formulated. How was it that the termite brain, as I supposed the machine to be, had never revealed itself to humans? They had often destroyed the homes of its peoples, but as far as I know, it has never retaliated. Yet, directly I appeared, it attacked me. 
though I was doing it no harm. Perhaps by some obscure means it knew that I was not a man, but an adversary worthy of its powers. Or perhaps, though I do not put the suggestion seriously, it, 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 it may be a kind of guardian protecting three from invaders such as ourselves. Somewhere, uh, somewhere there is an inconsistency that I cannot understand. On the one hand, we have that incredible intelligence possessing much, if not all, of our knowledge, while on the other are the blind, relatively helpless insects waging an endless war with puny weapons against enemies their ruler could exterminate instantly and without effort. Behind this mad system, there must be a purpose, but it is beyond my comprehension. The only rational explanation I can conceive is that for most of the time, the termite brain is, is uh, content to let its subjects go their own mechanical ways, and that only very seldom, perhaps once in an age, does it take an active part in guiding them. As, as long as it is not seriously interfered with, it is content to let man do what he likes. It may even uh, take, a, take a benevolent interest in him and his works. Fortunately for us, the super termite is not invulnerable. Twice it miscalculated in its dealings with me, and the second time cost it its existence. Uh, I, I cannot say its life. I am confident that we can overcome the creature for it, or others like it still control the remaining billions of the race. I have just returned from Africa, and termites there are still organized as they, as they have always been. Uh, on this excursion, I did not leave my ship, or even land, no, 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 I believe I have incurred the enmity of an entire race, and I am taking no chances. Until I have an armored cruiser and a staff of expert biologists, I am leaving the termites strictly alone. Even then I shall not feel quite safe, for there may yet be more powerful intelligences on three than the one I encountered. And that is a risk that we must take, for unless we can defeat these beings, Planet Three will never be safe for our kind. The president cut off the record and turned to the waiting assembly. You have heard Thetum's report, he said. I appreciate its importance and at once sent a heavy cruiser to three. As soon as it arrived, Thetum boarded and it left for the Pacific. That was two days ago. Uh, since then, I have heard from uh, neither Thetum nor the cruiser. Uh, but, but I do know this. Uh, an hour after the ship left England, we picked up the radiations from her screen, and in a very few seconds, other disturbances, uh, cosmics, ultracosmics, uh, induction, and tremendous long-wave, low-quantum radiations, such as we have never used in battle, began to come through in, in ever-increasing quantities, and this lasted for nearly three minutes when suddenly there came one titanic blast of energy lasting for a fraction of a second, and then, uh, then, uh, nothing, nothing. That final burst of power could have been caused by nothing less, nothing less than the detonation of an entire atomic generating plant, and it must have jarred three to its core. Now, <clears throat> I have called this meeting to put the facts of the matter before you and to ask you to vote on the subject. Shall we abandon our plans for three, or shall we send one of our most powerful super dreadnoughts to the planet? One ship could do as much as an entire section of the fleet in this matter and would be safe in case, in case, uh, but, but I cannot imagine any, any power which could defeat such a ship as our Zoranta. Uh, will you please register your votes in the usual way? It will be a great setback if we cannot colonize three. But it is not the only planet in the system, though it is the fairest. There came the subdued clicks and a faint humming of motors as the counselors pressed their colored buttons. And on the television screen appeared the words, four, 967, against 233. Very well. The Zaranda will leave at once for three. This time, we will follow her movements with the televisor, and then, if anything does go wrong, we shall at least obtain some idea of the weapons that this enemy uses. Hours later, the tremendous mass of the flagship of the Martian fleet dropped thunderously through the outer reaches of Earth's atmosphere toward the far-off waters of the Pacific. She fell 
in the heart of a tornado, for her captain was taking no chances, and the winds of the stratosphere were being annihilated by her flaming ray screen. But on a tiny island, far over the eastern horizon, the termites had been preparing for the attack they knew must come, and strange, fragile mechanisms had been erected by myriad blind and toiling insects. The great Martian warship was 200 miles away when her captain located the island in his televisor. His finger reached toward the button which would start the enormous ray generators, but swift as he was, the almost instant acting relays of the termite mind were far swifter, though in any case the outcome would have been the same. The great spherical screens did not flare even once as the enemy struck home. Their slim rapier of pure heat was driven by only a score of horsepower, while behind the shields of the warship were a thousand million. But the feeble heat beam of the termites never passed through those screens. It reached out through hyperspace to gnaw at the very vitals of the ship. The Martians could not check an enemy who struck from within their defenses, an enemy to whom a sphere was no more a barrier than a hollow ring. The termite rulers, those alien beings from outer space, had kept their agreement with the old lords of Earth and had saved man from the danger his ancestors had long ago foreseen. But the watching assembly knew only that the screens of the ship which had been blazing fiercely one moment had erupted in a hurricane of flame and a numbing concussion of sound, while for a thousand miles around, fragments of white-hot metal were dropping from the heavens. Slowly, the president turned to face the council and whispered in a low, strained voice, I think it had better be Planet Two, after all. Wacky, first published in The Fantast, July 1942. Collected in The Best of Arthur C. Clarke, 1937 to 1955. Wacky was first published in The Fantast, edited by Aberdeen fan Douglas Webster, who had previously taken over the magazine from one Christopher Samuel Yaud, better known to science fiction readers as John Christopher. The telephone honked melodiously. He picked it up, and after a moment's hesitation asked, Hello? Is that me? The answer he had been fearing came back. You, it is. Who are you? He sighed. Argument was useless. Besides, he knew he was in the wrong. All right, he said wearily. You win. A sudden purple twinge of toothache nearly choked him for a moment, and he added hopelessly, Don't forget to have that stopping seen to this afternoon. Ouch! As if I would, growled the voice testily. There was a pause. Well, what do you want me to do now? He asked at last. The reply, though half expected, was chilling. Do? It doesn't matter. You just aren't. The amazing affair of the elastic-sided egg whisk, said the great detective, would no doubt have remained unsolved to this very day if by great misfortune it had ever occurred. The fact that it didn't, I count as one of my luckiest escapes. Those of us who possessed heads nodded in agreement. He paused to drain the sump of his hooker, then continued. But even that fades into insignificance before the horrible tragedy that occurred in the house where the Aspidistra ran amok. Fortunately, I was not born at the time. Otherwise, I should certainly have been one of the victims. We shuddered in assent. Some of us had been there. Some of us were still there. W weren't you connected with a curious case of the camperated kipper? He coughed deprecatingly. Intimately, I was the camperated kipper. At this point, two men arrived to carry me back to the taxidermists, so I cannot tell you any more. Phew, said the man in the pink silk pyjamas. 
I had a horrid dream last night. Oh, said the other disinterestedly. Yes, I thought that my wife had poisoned me for the insurance. It was so vivid, I was mighty glad when I woke up. Indeed, said his companion politely. And just where do you think you are right now?